On December 7, 1941, the U.S. military base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, was bombed by the Imperial Japanese, killing 2,403 people total, including 68 civilians. The impact was monumental, both for the war and the thousands of Japanese Americans living in the United States. Japanese immigrants first arrived in the United States in the 1880s, contracted to work on railroads and farms. They gathered on the west coast in Hawaii due to their proximity to Japan. For these first generation Japanese immigrants, also known as the Ise, life in America proved difficult as the negative perception of Asian immigrants was fueled by the image of an unskilled, uneducated laborer working on the railroads. This led to a series of anti-Asian groups that sought to exclude Japanese and Chinese immigrants from obtaining jobs and education. Such groups included the Asiatic Exclusion League based in California, which said, the Asiatic race and the Caucasian race never could and never can exist in the same territory. They can never blend, harmonize, commingle, or live together in peace. It was common knowledge among the men of the 442nd that they couldn't get the same jobs or opportunities as their white counterparts. For the same level of education, Japanese Americans made roughly half the earnings on average as whites. These were similar wages that African Americans made in the segregated American South. However, Many of the Issei loved their new country, choosing to continue living in America and starting families. When America entered World War I, many Issei volunteered to fight in the army, laying down their lives to protect their new country. Their children, the Nisei, or second generation Japanese Americans, showed similar love for their country. After the Pearl Harbor bombing, Thousands of Japanese American young men rushed to military recruitment centers to volunteer to fight, but they were met with an insult. When the Nisei went to volunteer, they found out that the government had classified them as enemy aliens, and they were forced to leave because enemies of the state can't fight for the state. Imagine that. Imagine volunteering to fight in a war. Imagine devoting your life to a cause, or preparing to devote your life to a cause, and then your government turns around and says, oh, we don't want you. Just because of your complexion, just because you look like the guys you're fighting, th this is just absolutely terrible. And despite living their entire lives as Americans, Despite getting an American education, and despite being American citizens, they were still barred from participating in the war originally. In Hawaii, the hysteria was even worse. Japanese American members of the Hawaii National Guard spent the aftermath of Pearl Harbor preparing for another Japanese attack, clearing rubble and donating blood to help survivors. But an order soon came for all Japanese Americans in the National Guard to return their weapons with many dishonorably discharged. The remaining members were placed under surveillance. But the patriotism of the Hawaii Nisei persisted. Hundreds of discharges petitioned the military governor to allow them to form the Varsity Victory Volunteers. They were a group that was prohibited from seeing combat, but they helped the war effort by embarking on construction projects, building houses, fences, bridges, and supplying soldiers with food. Seeing the patriotism of the squadron, the U.S. government permitted the formation of an all-Japanese battalion that could see combat. They came to be named the 100th Infantry Battalion, consisting of about 400 members. This would come to be the precursor of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Back on the mainland, hysteria was reaching new heights. Military advisors urged President Franklin Roosevelt to take action to protect national security from Japanese spies. He responded by passing Executive Order 9066. Executive Order 9066 is a real dark spot in American history. Tens of thousands of Japanese Americans, many of them American citizens, 
were told to pack their bags and board trains to internment camps, where they were forced to stay for the duration of the war. Not only was it illegal, it was the antithesis of the values of Western democracy. You see, under the provisions of the U.S. Constitution, we are guaranteed the right to freedom of speech, habeas corpus, protection from unreasonable search and seizure, and protection from cruel or unusual punishment. In the name of national security, we violated all of these, not to mention the foundation of American democracy, which is the unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What we were doing to Japanese Americans was not all that different from what the Nazis were doing to the Jews. America, which criticized the inhumanity of the Holocaust, was at the height of hypocrisy, as what was happening in the U.S. was also inhumane and very similar. To protect American freedom, what did we do? We destroyed American freedom. And with all of this, there was not a single case of treason or disloyalty from Japanese Americans. They did nothing to deserve this. But over in Camp Shelby, Oakland, Midwest, the 100th Infantry Battalion received astounding training scores. Their military superiors saw in those 400 men dedication, intense loyalty, bravery, and what will come to be the team motto, go for broke, to never give up, to give it your all every time, all the time. They were so impressed that the military reversed the decision to ban Japanese Americans from the army and a notice went out immediately to recruit Japanese-American soldiers. However, there is one problem. Most of them were now living in the internment camps. The military sent out notice to all the internment camps for the recruitment of young Japanese-American men. They asked for 3,000 volunteers. What they got was 11,000, more than three times the number. This was truly an amazing act of loyalty. These men had their constitutional rights stripped from them and they were betrayed by their government. Yet they continued to believe in the values of American democracy and they continued to believe in the American people. They were willing to lay their lives on the line to fight not only for American freedom and for world democracy and peace, but for their own freedom. And they thought they could prove their worthiness of being American and prove themselves on the battlefield. However, the Nisei were still faced with much of the same discrimination. The recruitment of Japanese Americans didn't sit well, neither with the American public nor the military. The White House received angry letters of protest regularly, with one Californian writing, put these babies at slave labor and feed them on rotten fish and a little rice like they do our boys. We're disgusted that you even foster such a thought. We want every Jap in this country eliminated after the war. Even before enlisting, the volunteers were subjected to a humiliating screening test, with one of the questions being, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the United States from any or all attack by foreign or domestic forces, and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese Emperor, or any other foreign government, power, or organization? Some, who couldn't tolerate insult after insult, refused to answer the question. However, thousands of others answered yes and they formed the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. They traveled to the Midwest to complete their training. Unsurprisingly, they produced astounding results, just like the 100th Infantry Battalion. Each and every one of these men was willing to sacrifice his life to prove his loyalty for his country, and it showed in the way he fought. On June 26, 1944, the 442nd was sent to the Italian front to fight under General Mark Clark. He was the only general willing to take the new Japanese American recruits, and he would later come to commend them for their bravery in battle, and fight for the recognition and respect when they were again faced with racial prejudice. Though the 100th Battalion had been battling separately as parts of other units for over a year, Bel de Verde was the first time the 442nd and the 100th fought together as a single combat team. Though the 442nd had many combat victories, their most noble ones were the rescue of the Lost Battalion and the taking of the Gothic Line. So the rescue of 
Defeating the Lost Battalion is really one of the defining moments in terms of proving the 442nd's loyalty to the United States. On October 23rd, the 141st Regiment was split up while fighting a German line. Under Sergeant Charles Coolidge, the left flank ran into heavy German attacks and the right flank was overrun. They were named the Lost Battalion because nobody thought that they could be rescued. They were so deep in enemy territory, surrounded by German soldiers, but the 442nd Regiment was ordered to move in anyways. When they got close to the German line, they charged in without hesitating, screaming Banzai, despite all the artillery shells, gunfire, debris, and fallen comrades at their side. And when they saw this, like any reasonable people, they did flee. Of course, the charge wasn't without consequences, as one company was reduced to only 20 soldiers and another just two. The 442nd started with almost 3,000 men before the mission, and afterwards they only had less than about 800. But you see, the most important thing was that they showed that they were willing to sacrifice their lives to save fellow soldiers, and this proved their loyalty and it's demonstrated how they were loyal to the country and how they were loyal citizens without a shadow. If the rescue of the Lost Battalion was astounding, the taking of the Gothic line was even more so. It was March of 1945 when the 442nd was sent in. The Gothic line was among the only remaining German strongholds left, but it was almost impossible to take. The 5th Army had been stalemated there for almost half a year. German forces hold themselves up, placing heavy artillery along the Apennine Mountains and more than 2,000 machine gun nests with interlocking fire. The backside was a sheer rock cliff that stretched thousands of feet high. Despite the terrifying prospects of the climb carrying the full gear, the 442nd decided the best course of action to end the stalemate would be to climb the cliff and launch a surprise attack at dawn. Let me tell you, it was extremely easy to lose your footing on that rock cliff. At times, there wasn't even a path. At other times, the rock foundation was very deep. Many fell, but nobody called out or screamed while falling because they had to fall silently or the surprise attack would fail because of German fear. That's how strong their willpower and dedication was. The 442nd Regiment made it up to the German base just at the crack of dawn and surprised them. They killed and captured all of them, completing what the entire 5th Army could do for six months in a matter of half an hour. And just days later, the rest of the Gothic line fell. The 442nd's bravery in battle did not go unnoticed. The official casualty rate for the 442nd was 314%, and the unit had to be replaced two and a half times. This meant that the men who volunteered after the first round of recruitment knew that they were almost guaranteed to be killed or injured, and yet they still went. Many wounded ignored orders to return home and continued fighting. For that, the title of most decorated unit in American history belongs to the 442nd. The unit earned 9,486 Purple Hearts, 8 Presidential Citations, 21 Medals of Honor, 52 Distinguished Service Crosses, and 4,000 Bronze Stars, with a total of 18,143 awards over the course of two years. And so let me tell you, these guys were the definition of badass. You have Daniel Inouye, a young man from Prepped to being a surgeon, but eventually chose to fight in the war to prove his loyalty to the nation. When he was ordered to lead a charge on a German stronghold, his team came within 40 yards with three machine gun nests and heavy artillery. He started throwing grenades to destroy the nests, but he was shot through the stomach. His supervisors ordered him to return and receive medical treatment, but instead, what did he do? He crawled alone to the first two machine gun nests and destroyed them both with grenades single-handedly and also single-armedly as as he lived. When he got to the third nest, his arm was shredded to pieces by gunfire and shrapnel. This guy was not phased at all. He just cried a lot of grenades from his shredded arm and blew the third machine gun nest up. After that, he couldn't even stand, so he propped himself up against a tree and fired a 
Cyrus, Tommy, and one handed until the rest of his unit had evacuated to a better position. And he eventually passed out and doesn't actually have any memory of this. When your team's full of guys like that, it's no wonder the Germans were seeing their foreign recruits in the factory. And it's no wonder why U.S. generals were practically fighting to get their hands on the 442nd Regiment by the second half of the war as these people were previously considered enemy aliens. Inouye went on to become the second longest serving U.S. Senator of all time, never losing a single election in his lifetime and serving the state of Hawaii. When the 442nd returned home, they had undergone a radical transformation, from feared enemy aliens to decorated war heroes, from dirty Japs to Americans of Japanese ancestry. Their praise was universal, from radio talks to newspapers to government officials and military generals. Captain Crowley, who fought alongside the 442nd in Italy, said, Every one of them served beyond the call of duty. I could see no difference in their blood and ours on the battlefield. When presenting them with a unit citation on the White House lawn, President Harry Truman said, You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice and you have won. Keep up that fight, and we will continue to win to make this great republic stand for just what the Constitution says it stands for, the welfare of all the people, all the time. By laying down their lives to protect the country that betrayed them, the men of the 442nd didn't just fight the enemy, they proved something, that they were loyal, that they were patriots, that they were Americans.